Roquefort. Exclusivity, sophistication, decadence, taste. Good. It's just really, really strong. <laughs> oh my God, that's so bad. It's like too much. Or it tastes like blue cheese that was cured in my grandmother's casket. Like a mouthful of warm hair. Vaseline. That's gross. so much. Why is it so expensive? Welcome to Roquefort sur Salzon, home to the renowned Roquefort cheese. Roquefort is an ivory colored cheese with emerald green veining and a creamy, moist texture. Roquefort sur Salzon is a small commune with a population of 685 people located near the top of the Combalou Caves and Mountain, far away from large populations. Roquefort can only be reached through a small, windy two-lane road up to the city and has limited train access. The cheese producers all the way up here go to considerable lengths and costs to make it just right. Why do they go through all the trouble? The French claim that Roquefort is not like other cheese. It's unique, special, and better. One of the reasons they keep producing the cheese in such a remote place using often inefficient methods is that it grants them the exclusive right to label and market their cheese. They get a protected label of origin from the French government. Roquefort cheese is different from other cheeses in that it can only be made in Roquefort sur Salzon caves. In fact, Roquefort cheese must be made with raw milk from ewes that live in Aveyron. Producers must use Penicillin Roquefort to make the cheese with the whole process of maturing, cutting, and packaging taking place in the area of Roquefort. Nothing can be outsourced to more convenient or low-cost areas. Nothing can be changed in the name of efficiency. The distinctive blue cheese that has become famous around the world has had a long history. How did it all begin? Legend has it, a long, long time ago, a shepherd boy kept his sheep at the base of the Kumbalu Mountain. One day, he sat with his flock in one of the nearby caves to eat his lunch of bread and cheese. And then he saw her, the most beautiful, attractive maiden. Love struck, he hurried after her. Attractive but elusive, he chased after her down the mountain. He never did find her, but after several months, he returned to the cave and noticed his abandoned lunch. The Meticillium Rook 40 had molded the cheese until it was marbled through with blue and green. Intrigued, he ate it anyway. He discovered that it was absolutely delicious. Roquefort cheese, the king of all cheeses, was born. Well, we don't know if that's really how it happened, but we do know that Roquefort has been around for a long time. In fact, Roquefort could be bought in Roman markets as far back as 76 BC. In the late 700s, Emperor Charlemagne received two mule loads of Roquefort at his palace every year at Christmas time. In 1666, the French government granted the village of Roquefort the exclusive right to make the cheese. The philosoph Diderot declared Roquefort to be the king of all cheeses in 1782. Originally, small, independent family farms made the cheese, but in 1863 they consolidated to create the larger company of Societe, which produces a majority of all Roquefort cheese today. Just as it was traditionally produced, Roquefort cheese must be created following a specific procedure. First, the sheep. The sheep must be certain breeds and they can only be grazed on a specific oval area around the larger plains. Three-fourths of all of their food must come from that 16-mile area. Their whole raw and unfiltered milk must be delivered at least 20 days after lambing. The good news for the sheep of Roquefort is that they're very well taken care of by their shepherds because of how rare they are and how valuable their milk is. Then the mold! Plus they had green, weird, slimy stuff. Farmers originally grew the mold on rye bread by leaving it in the caves for months. Currently, it's still grown on bread, but in a lab. The same exact strain of Penicillin Rook 40 is used today. It makes the cheese blue and green and gives it its distinctive flavor. Next comes the curing process. 
The cheese is cured in the caves of Roquefort, which are always around 50 degrees Fahrenheit with 90% humidity and an air renewal rate of about 1 million cubic meters a day. So much air gets moved through the caves thanks to fluorines, small tunnels that formed with the caves and the mountains collapsed ages ago. No other cheese cellar on earth has these specific characteristics. The cheese first has to ripen, covered in salt, and on wooden slats. Wood is important for fostering fungus growth. Ripening takes 14 to 25 days, and after that, the cheese matures for another three months. After months in the caves, Roquefort is processed and packaged. The producers of Roquefort cheese united in 1928 and created the General Confederation of Used Milk Producers and Producers of Roquefort Cheese. The Confederation works to reduce the cost of milking, lambing, and selling cheese to global distributors. An American multinational corporation in France, Lactalis Group, owns and distributes Roquefort cheese to its American and European subsidiaries and marketplaces. Roquefort is sent off in refrigerated trucks, then crosses the ocean in refrigerated planes to distributors and cooperatives like Associated Foods. Associated Foods distributes Roquefort cheese in select Utah marketplaces. At Harmon's, for example, it sells for $27 a pound. Although it is sold all over the world, no one else at any other location can make Roquefort, even if they use the same ingredients or the same techniques. It has to be made in that specific area and with that specific process, so there are only 19,000 tons produced a year. The cheese is given a special AOC labeling to prove compliance, which is provided by the National Institute of Origin and Quality. The company claims full traceability of product throughout the whole life of the cheese, with bacteriological chemical analysis, as well as a visual inspection. Everything has to be perfect in order for the cheese to make the cut and receive its AOC label. In a way, the geographical indicator that the government gives to specific foods is a type of protectionism. The product cannot be made or sold from anywhere else, and so the eight companies in Roquefort Sir Solzon have a sort of oligopolistic cheese cartel. The AOC distinction is important for them to market their product and close off their niche market to other cheese producers. Without these geographical indicators eliminating the market for other cheese producers, this blue cheese could be made available to a lot more people at a fraction of the cost. New innovations could streamline the process, while shipping costs could be reduced. Is Roquefort just another excuse for governments to disrupt the free market and foster inefficiencies? Agricultural policies are, are one of the primary blocks to um, a more liberal economic world. We have this tendency to protect our farmers, which gets in the way of free trade. In, in that way, um, I would say that Roquefort cheese and, and what it stands for could potentially be harmful. I don't find the French particularly exceptional, but I do find it as a pretty strong sign of French protectionism. The only way you're going to get people to want this cheese is to protect this cheese because it's just not pulling it on taste. I think that the French policy is just purely protectionism that might probably not be justified in the long term. The United States definitely thinks so. Americans tend to scorn the geographical indicators as attempts to simply keep competition out of the market. While we may not be able to empathize with food tradition or high cultural standards, we do understand government subsidies on agricultural products to make them easier to compete, like sugar or corn. So Americans may assume that French cheese farmers are just good lobbyists. That's part of the reason that highly exclusive goods like Roquefort are large targets for tariffs. The story of Roquefort cheese's high price arises from the 90s EU-US hormone beef dispute which illustrated what a dysfunctional relationship the two trade partners had. In 1981, the European Union implemented restrictions on hormones in animal and meat production because of fears about their health effects. Eight years later, they established a full ban on all imports of meat and meat products from animals treated with growth promotants, thus targeting U.S. meat production. Hey honey, how's it going? I was thinking we could... Hey. What is that? Is that a burger? Honey, you know that the hormones that they put in that beef aren't good for you. You are not allowed to have those in our house. Honey, we've been over this. The beef is safe and it tastes so good and it's affordable. And it's efficient, think of the corporations, they're people too. You don't even know what real food is. The United States, unhappy with the beef ban, imposed 100% tariffs to retaliate. The U.S. restricted a variety of European products, including goose pâté, French chocolate, truffles, soups, Dijon mustards, juices, chicory, and roquefort cheese. The American tariff remained in effect until the EU sought relationship counseling from the World Trade Organization. Don't bring that to my house. Hey, we talked about this with the therapist. You're supposed to let me bring in my wine, chicory, chocolate, truffles. You want to bring in the therapist? He said my beef was safe. No, he did not. 
In 1999, the World Trade Organization ruled that the European Union was unjustified in the ban and allowed the United States to take out its revenge to the tune of $116 million in tariffs against some of the most culturally important European food. Look, he did say my people was safe, and he did say you're not holding up your end of this relationship. You and your snooty ideas of what real food is. What is real food? What is real food? What is this goose pate? Truffles? Chicory? What is chicory? What is that? Nobody knows. What really matters is this burger. I can get loaded with beef for a fraction of the cost. Now, either of us can do what we want. You disgust me. You don't disgust me? That stinky old cheese you bring in here all day. <gasps> what? Yeah, it's disgusting. It reminds me of my grandma's casket. Like warm, sweaty hair and vaseline. <sighs> Say my beef isn't welcome. Can't bring your cheese in here either. And the U.S. didn't end there. In 2009, the tariff on Roquefort was raised from 100% to 300%. This led to a significant cooling in the EU-U.S. relationship. But you just think you're so special. You're the exception. Ugh, you're not. You're not the exception. You're not special. And on your way out, you take your stinky shoes with you. No! You can finally accept my beef. We'll talk. Ah! Ow. After numerous negotiations, more fights, many more tears between the EU and the U.S., and a special gift of Roquefort cheese presented to President Obama, the U.S. finally lowered the tariff, and Roquefort is now subject to 100% tariff once again. So why pick on Roquefort? Because it is a sign of French exceptionalism, something Americans don't quite understand culturally. France argued in the 1993 GATT negotiations that culture is not a commodity, and that it therefore should not be subject to trade laws. In fact, cultural agricultural identity is so important that French farmers frequently protest about it. Why would Roquefort deserve such a distinction? What makes Roquefort so exceptional? The first reason goes back to a French idea called Stravois la vie, which means savor life. It is a fundamental difference of how the French approach food. In America, we like to eat, but we don't enjoy the food in the same way. To us, food is a means to an end, but in France, food is an experience in and of itself to be enjoyed. Roquefort is no different. Eating Roquefort cheese, as all of our test subjects will agree, is an experience, and that is what French food is all about. Another fundamental characteristic of French culture is the idea of terroir, which is the connection between culture, food, and the land it was produced on. Those aspects are inseparable. In the French mind, food takes on part of its identity through the land that it's created on. Land is considered to be a heritage for future generations. The fact that the cheese can only come from one small, beautiful region in France increases the exclusive status of the cheese. This makes the cheese even more valuable in French eyes. And Roquefort does taste distinctive. While not everyone agrees that it tastes good, it certainly carries a unique and nuanced flavor. Because the French love their food, they have more appreciation for what other cultures would normally consider unpalatable. And we can say from experience that Roquefort really does grow on you. Making Roquefort is considered to be an artisanal craft, with master ripeners who walk along the rows of cheese, smelling and touching them to make sure their ripening process is going correctly. They can know simply by the smell when a cheese is ripe. The French value this expertise and technique and consider cheese making to be a reflection of the value of the land, sheep, and history. They consider it to be art. If you think about art, um, we protect art, right, in, 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 in all its forms. and. Uh, I don't think Americans really think of their food so much as art. Roquefort is a controversial cheese, being the target of terrorists and the poster food for elite protectionist policies. Is it crazy to assume that Roquefort cheese has a cultural identity in France? Maybe it's not just economic protectionism, but that Roquefort cheese has its own legacy. In an increasingly homogenized world, the culture surrounding Roquefort is a unique commodity worth looking after. Cheese can be art. 